for our son in law, he's Pensler. Okay. He just got out of the hospital and they moved him to a nursing home where he's in rehab. They said that his, he has chronic liver and kidney disease. And he's real jaundiced right now. So we don't know how things are going to turn out there. My brother didn't really get into it at all. He's our son in law. While we're talking about that side of the family, we'll keep praying for baby Troy. Yeah. And we are, he's waiting to gain some weight now, right? Yeah. Yeah, he has gained some. Yeah. Sarah hasn't told me that much, but his last name is Klein. <laughs> I know you. Oh. I have family names Klein. It's a hard thing to be going through. And we learned a very, very important piece of information last night. Um, we learned Billy the Goat's true last name. Uh, Billy the Goat is also known as Mr. Peabody. So, Billy Peabody. I think it's Sir William Peabody. I'm not sure. You can call him anything you want as long as you have food. As long as you got a loaf of bread, you can call him anything you want. Yeah. So. <laughs> that was a very inspirational part of yeah, so we, I know some of, some people know and some people don't, but just to keep everyone on the same page. Um, we did the first night of our prayer crawl last night, and so our first stop was at the camp's house. Uh, Isaac's neighbor, we've been praying for Rick and his wife and, and their kids. And as soon as we got there, they were ready and waiting for us and invited us inside, and they had chairs set up for us, and Rick started praying for us. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Um, and we know his pastor and, you know, small world, but um, it was, it was, I thought there couldn't have been a better way to kick it off. No. So um, we prayed for him and he prayed for us and everybody prayed for the world and it was, it was beautiful. Um, you know who to go see if he feels down. Yeah, I know, man. He, I, I want to say this, the, you know, the most respectful way I can, talking about the health struggles he had. I expected someone frail, you know? And then it was like, you know, like Incredible Hulk Santa Claus gave me a hug. And it was amazing, you know? Yeah. yeah. But his I smile and his joy. Yeah. So it was very nice that we got to see him. Yeah. Cody's on with us. Hi, Cody. And Charlene said to tell you hello, Cody. Um, and Jane is on with us, and Diane is on with us. So thank you guys for joining us. And thanks to Diane for getting all this organized. So we wanted to pray for the four families we visited um, last night. So we, the Camp family, then we saw the Ragones, then the Brooks, um, and children and grandchildren, you know, whole family. Um, and then we got to see Barbara, well, we got to go to Barbara and Deborah's house too. Did I get that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're, we want to pray for all four of those households. They're going to be a focus for us all week to keep praying. Um, and then next Tuesday, we'll visit some more houses. So if anybody's interested, next Tuesday at 7 p.m., we're going to be here at the church. And then we're going to go out and visit some homes and pray. We're going to pray for everybody on Leap Drive. Yeah, we're hitting Leap Drive next week. So <laughs> we're going to be visiting the Nepalese. We're going to be visiting... Elise and her husband and her son 
and then we're going to be visiting Patty. They're all like within a block. I think my daughter lives yeah, your daughter's on our list. I'm not sure if we're going to get to her this coming Tuesday or if she's the next one. I haven't mentioned it yet. Well, because we're also heading up that way, because we're going to be hitting um, Faye, and I think we're also going to be going to another house right now. Um, I think we're going to have two nights for Pen for Pennzoil in town. Um, yeah. So it was off to a wonderful start, and we are going to keep praying for all these families. And um, another praise that I'm going to hog uh, when, or Sunday night was awesome. We had uh, a dozen kids come out, and uh, with a lot of kids, and uh, thankfully Joe survived. It was close. Um, but we had enough Cheerios for all the kids. So that's what was important. That was their lesson that night. Uh, so if anybody's interested, our Sunday night series, it uses a different kind of breakfast cereal every week to help teach the lesson. So their memory verse this past Sunday was from Psalm 34, right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then they had Honey Nut Cheerios for their, that the, everybody got a little bag of them. Um, do you know what next week's cereal is? Next week's Rice Krispies. Next week's Rice Krispies. But there's a different cereal each week, and then it, the, something about the cereal connects to the Bible. So just the honey in the honey nut cereal is sweet. You know. Where in the Bible does it say snack for a uh, This one is actually, it's about hearing God's word. Oh, about that's, hearing God's word. Yeah, so the snap crackle that you hear. Oh, yeah. I like it. I like it. So uh, keep praying for Sunday nights and the kids, and it really was just a wonderful night. Uh, a couple kids that have been coming came first, and then another little girl came, and she texted some of the other neighborhood kids. And um, I think every kid that was there are actually kids that, at least one time or another, have been here to yes. the church. Yeah, for BBS so and stuff like that. They, they weren't strangers to us, but yeah, kids that had been here for BBS and some things like that, but hadn't been coming regularly. So it was just a really wonderful night to celebrate. Well, Mayla, a couple days ago, they were talking about. Two banks of the whole country are blowing up. I mean, every you know, they're, they're just overwhelmed. But people are hard to I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. You go in and you get little three little bags and it costs you $130. And you just, like, yeah. What did I buy? No meat. Yeah. 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 I also want to give, I also want to give praise that we're able to feed those 12 kids afterwards. Yeah, well, that was the other thing. We, we had such a wonderful night, you know, the grown-ups are in here and we're laughing up a storm as the kids are coming in and the kids are down there playing games and then the Isaacs cooked dinner for everybody. So we all got to have uh, chicken alfredo with fettuccine for dinner. Um, so it was just a great family blessing. I don't know, the love was just overwhelming. It was. So it was, very it was, it was like great. a family said. Yeah, it was beautiful. So for anybody online, come join us next Sunday night. It's amazing. Um, oh, Trudy's on with us as well. Hello, Trudy. Um, we're just sharing some prayer requests. So any of our Facebook friends online, if you want to go ahead and put your requests in the chat, we'll get you in as you come through. So do we have other prayer requests anyone would like to share? What was that? Jane? Jeannie. Oh, Jeannie Lewis. Hey, Jeannie. I'm trying to write Rick, and I'm thinking about your son, because of Janice, and I wrote, I wrote Ralph instead of Rick, and oh, my brain. Okay. It's still, it's still all wound up in Sunday. It was a good night. Last night was a good night. Today is a good day. It's been a good day. We had a couple praises for our family. Um, my stepbrother came home from the hospital today. He's on the mend. Amen for that. He's had a really hard couple of months. And my stepdad had his ablation done today. And that went well. So they were two things we've been praying about in our family that are huge praises. Yeah. 
A um, couple other, sorry. She needs more family. Okay, wonderful. I'm still learning. I've got a hundred years worth of history to try to learn, so. She's got almost that many years of history to You can kick him, you know. Uh, <laughs> so Bonnie has asked us to keep praying for her family. Um, Thomas is still doing well. He came home from the hospital. Uh, Bonnie has, uh, she injured her foot, so she's not supposed to be walking on it right now. So that's why she couldn't be with us in person on Sunday, but she is home from Kentucky. So we're glad that she made it home safe. And uh, we want to keep Amy and the rest of her kids in our prayers. And uh, we got news that Barry got a puppy, so that's a craze. Um, but there are several in in their uh, several of her kids and grandkids who need some prayer right now. So we're just going to lift up Bonnie and all of her various offspring, uh, the whole family. Um, there was an earthquake last week in the Philippines, 7.0 earthquake. So we need to lift that up in our prayers. Um, let's see, we've got Russ that we're praying for, who was supposed to have a procedure yesterday, right? Yeah. Do we have any follow-up on him or no? No. Because you don't see, you won't see him. I might find out something on Friday, when we delivered vegetables. We will keep him in our prayers, and hopefully his procedure went well, too. Um, let's see. We want to keep Betty and Luke in our prayers. And um, we had another kind of unspoken prayer request for a couple. Um, the husband is going to be having a procedure to have kidney stones broken up. The wife is just home from the hospital and recovering. So we're going to lift up that couple. She's not oh, she's not home yet. Okay, sorry. Deciding whether to bring her home with us. Or, or okay. Or okay. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay. And the family that Eric is about. Yes, Eric has another neighbor that he was able to bring food to the other night. Oh, speaking of food, somebody donated three cases of Chef Boyardee the other night. That was nice. Yeah, I know. So there's three new cases of Chef Boyardee in the pantry. Yeah. Also, some of it is the canned ravioli, and some of it are like the little microwave ones that the kids like, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Are you on the box? Yes. Uh, next week. What's uh, We're still figuring that out. What's the note of I know. We're, <laughs> we're working on it. But at this point, it looks like it's going to, Edgar and I are going to be running over and pulling off the trucks. Um, yep. Uh, I think that's most of them. Uh, we need to keep praying for Bethany, please. And she is still searching for a job. And uh, we want to keep praying for... Deborah, and then of course Barbara and Kelly as they are caring for her. And while we're waiting for more to come in, we have our international one, which I guess it's not technically international tonight, because tonight we are praying for Puerto Rico. And I'm not entirely sure. My civics is rusty. I'm, I think... Uh, Puerto Rico is still considered an incorporated territory. Yeah, I it's correct. territory it's not state. Well, I'm, it's, I know it's not a state, but I know it's not independent either. So I don't know. I think we're all a little confused by it. But um, it's a beautiful place, and our friend Ivelisse just moved here from there. So, of course, we've had some connections there. Ivelisse's mother still lives there, so and, and some other family members. So. You know, we've prayed for them as they've had some different weather issues and, and um, you know, they've struggled greatly with natural disasters the last few years. Um, but as far as the Church of the Nazarene goes, 
The Church of the Nazarene began its work in Puerto Rico in 1944. It is a beautiful island in the Caribbean. Um, Jill and I had the pleasure of visiting there on our honeymoon. Um, it is home of the Elyonque Rainforest. Uh, the population there is approximately 3.19 million. It has two official languages, English and Spanish. And they had, you know, Hurricane Maria in 2017. Then they had an earthquake. They've had more storms. And the, the damage that happened to their infrastructure, particularly the electrical grid, they have really struggled to make those repairs and get things up and running in a consistent way. So um, people having, you know, the refrigerators running and having electricity at medical facilities has really been a struggle. Um, during Hurricane Maria, um, nearly 3,000 people died. So, uh, very significant troubles they've been through. Um, the Church of the Nazarene in Puerto Rico has 4,000 members. There are 55 fully organized churches and one not yet fully organized church. There are 24 district licensed and 45 ordained ministers. So those are the basic stats. They have some prayer requests and some praises. Uh, some prayer requests they have are for the Genesis Initiative in the city of Mayaguez. G-U-E-Z, -G Guez. Or Gez. Gez. Okay. Um, and they're praying specifically for participating missionaries to be granted visas. But you know that's been a hard thing. Um, they are asking for prayer for the church planting projects in, all right, can you, can I just have my translator come help me here? Because I'm going to butcher these names and make them feel better. All right, so first of all, what's that city? My guess. My guess. So that's the city where the Genesis Initiative is happening. And then the church plantings are in? Utuado Village. In and San Sebastian. San Sebastian. Okay. And then I can say. San Sebastian. Sebastian. Okay, I didn't say that. Right. And I know how to say Arecibo because there's a telescope there. Okay. Um, so the church planting in Utuado and San Sebastian. They ask for prayer for the health of their pastors and for the provision for thousands of families who are in need because of the sudden and excessive cost of in sudden and excessive increase in the cost of living in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Trudy has asked for prayer for the people of Kentucky who are affected by the floods. Yes, thank you very much for bringing that up, Trudy. And um, we know it kind of spilled over a little bit too into some other states, but yeah, mostly Kentucky. So thank you for bringing that up, Trudy. I appreciate that. And now that I see Trudy's name again, um, we keep praying for Pastor Ralph in Bridgeton. been diagnosed with a kind of rare form of cancer. All right, back on track with Puerto Rico. Um, they have several praises. Um, they praise God um, that the Arecibo Cato Church of the Nazarene was able to resume in-person meetings, and there has been a great increase in the number of people being reached. Amen to that. They praise God because a pastor who was previously a part of the Salvation Army donated property, including a home, in the town of Humacao, and this created an opportunity for the church to restart work there. So to have not only property donated, but property with a house on it, amen. That's a church plant, ready to roll. Um, they praise God for the work done by those who participated in the Encuentro 2022 initiative. Seven concrete houses were repaired in multiple towns, and there was also repair work done on multiple churches. They praise God for the commitment of pastors, families, and lay leaders who have continued the work of the church in the midst of very challenging times. It's putting it lightly. <laughs> putting it lightly. Um, then they also have a, a testimony about that um, work and witness initiative, the Encuentro 2022. 
They had more than 250 volunteers who came to Puerto Rico to participate. Um, so I'm going to kind of back up and tell the story. The Puerto Rico West District of the Church of Nazarene hosted Encuentro 2022 with more than 100 Puerto Ricans and 276 visitors from the continental U.S., including families, youth, and children. This is a ministry that provides opportunities to individuals and groups in the United States, or in the continental U.S., rather, to come and share the gospel to communities outside of the continental U.S. And this goal was accomplished through community service. Uh, the team held VBS events with games and Bible stories for children. They rebuilt the roof of a church building that was in very poor condition. They mixed and poured cement to repair parking lots and repaired the walls of several church buildings. In one of the Nazarene academic institutions, they provided materials for and then built ramps to make the area accessible to people with special needs. Amen. Amen. And as a church that just had a gift of ramps, we know how wonderful that is. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, they said at the beginning of the, this is, this is one of the people sharing their testimony. At the beginning of this trip, I hoped to make a difference in the life of just one person. But I did not realize that person would be me, said Shasta Reisner, a member of the Church of the Nazarene in Valparaiso, Indiana. I have never felt closer to God than I do now after my experience in Puerto Rico. I'm grateful to each person I met and that I will be friends with for the rest of my life. Amen. Um, when I read that, you probably know what I thought of, right? The chance to serve in the pantry and what a blessing that is. And how when we serve God, when we love our neighbors, when we serve our neighbors, when we worship through care, it is such a blessing. And as much as we set out to help other people, I feel like we get just as blessed. So... Um, there's a little bit more to this story. I'd encourage you, if you have not already, you can subscribe to this email. They also post it on the NMI Facebook group. So you can check, it, check out the whole thing on Facebook or by email. Of course, we're going to share it every week here at the prayer meeting. So if that's how you like to receive it, there's that too. Uh, I don't see any new prayer requests that came in over, over the computer. Do we have any other prayer requests for in here? While everybody's thinking, I do have a couple announcements I want to share, make sure we all know. I mentioned the prayer crawl. That's going to be every Tuesday at 7. We're going to meet here and then go out to different homes and pray. Um, in a week and a half, on Saturday, August 13th, we're having a church picnic here. Uh, we are going to be set up out on the lawn and in the gym. So if you uh, would like to participate, we want everybody to come who can. Um, if you would like to bring food to share, we can certainly use that. Uh, Charlene is the one maintaining the list. We have a, a sign sheet here at church where you can talk to Charlene directly to, or really any of us will get it to her. Um, and we've got several different things. We're going to have pulled pork and hamburgers and hot dogs and taco salad and heavenly eggs and uh, potato salad that I believe is going to have pickles in it, if I get my wish. We've had some debate amongst the families about whether potato salad should have pickles in it or not. I am very firmly on the pickle side of the line. <laughs> my wife is not. Okay, well then you can vote for pickles. You can help me. You can be my swing vote. <laughs> but anyway. Um, we're going to have a cornhole tournament set up out on the lawn. We are going to have the food set up inside in the gym with the air conditioning running. So if anybody has health concerns or if you're worried about weather, we're going to have that safe spot. And worst case, we're, we'll have an indoor cornhole tournament if God chooses to bless us with lots of rain. Um, the other thing, Saturday the 13th is also uh, from 8 in the morning till noon, the um, Sunday breakfast missions back to school route. So if you would like to bring school items to donate to that, you should bring them by this weekend. Uh, this Sunday at church, you should bring those items. Um, I don't have the entire list in front of me, but backpacks, pencils, notebooks, rulers, um, earbuds, so that they can use them with the computers at school. 
Now, but if you go to sundaybreakfastmission.org, they have a pop-up on their home page that'll it'll pop right up to let you know about the the back school rally, and, and that'll show you all the items there. Sure. So if you want, you can get one backpack and put all those items in it, or you can bring a bunch of one item, or you can bring one of an item, whatever. But please bring it by this Sunday so we can make sure everything gets to the mission in time to get all packed up. Okay. Um, so. Yes. Food pantry this month is going to be on the 27th. Yes. Um, Bo Lenza Paul will be here with pet food. Um, and we, we do have um, some food that's already been donated for this month. Some of our needs, as usual, we can always use canned ravioli and SpaghettiOs. Um, those are always a need. Cereal is something we always need lots of. So those are items we're a little bit short on right now. We can also use, what was that? Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese, yep. We, uh, soups. Fruit, all I have is cranberry sauce. Okay, well, with fruit, we're down to cranberry sauce, and that we just can't eat that in August, right? You're not allowed. <laughs> We're out of the so canned fruit or fruit cups? And beans. And beans, okay. And beans. Canned beans, not dried beans. We have enough dried beans. Oh, thank you. Somebody put the Sunday breakfast mission link in the chat. Oh, that was you? Oh, you're so thoughtful. Um, so those are some things we can use for the pantry. Um, we are asking for prayer for the pantry as we're working to expand some of our work. Um, and, and reach out to some new areas. Um, Jim and Carol got to bring produce to Village Arms again this week in their volunteer work with Bush was a blessing. And uh, you'll have to see the picture, it's beautiful. It's like a, like a Norman Rockwell painting. They had all the, all the veggies set out on the counter. Oh, beautiful. Um, but uh, we're hoping, well, we're gonna be bringing more food to them this month than we brought last month. And uh, of course, the more we give out, it means we need more. Um, we want to give another special thank you to the mission. Um, they are sending over a lot of food. Unfortunately, their big truck broke down, so please pray for provisions for that. It's not a great time of year for their big truck to break down. Um, so we may be doing a little bit of a shuttle run back and forth, but they do have lots of food that they have ready to give us. So they are going to be donating, um, depending on how many we can get, well over 100 boxes of food. As, as well as uh, frozen chickens. So just barbecue sauce. Yeah, so so there we go. If you want to donate barbecue sauce to go with the chickens, that was really neat when we got to do that last month, or that was a couple months ago. Yeah. We got to give a bottle of barbecue sauce with every chicken. That was really cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the pieces are coming together. We still need more help. And you know, the more food that comes in, the more food we can give out. And especially right now towards the end of the summer, you know, families have been struggling. A lot of families depend on the school system to help kids get breakfast and lunches, and we don't have all of that in the summer. You guys probably know that some of the summer feeding programs that were running the last couple summers are not running anymore. So every little bit is a help. Um, also, if anyone has a need, please come to us. Right? Um, we can give you food. We can give you food to take to a neighbor. Yeah, we, have, we can do big boxes, little boxes, all kinds of boxes. Another round of peanut, butter and jelly. peanut butter and jelly, yes. Another one that we always love to give. Peanut butter and jelly. Um, thankfully, it looks like we're going to have eggs to give out again this month. So that's a huge one. If you want to donate hot dogs, frozen hot dogs, that's another food item we've been trying to give out every month. That's a good, easy meal, especially a kid-friendly one. Some of us have picky children who don't like to eat things. Sometimes you get one kid who will eat hot dogs and one kid who won't. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking. Yeah, that never happens in your family. Never happens in my family. But anyway, um, please pray for, for just the whole thing. And I'm just really loving how this is working out. Um, with bushels of blessings and with the mission and with some um, other churches that are stepping in to be participants now, um, just to see the community coming together as a community loving each other. That was one of the best things about prayer last night is when we went to 
when we went to the camp house, you know, Rick is praying for us, and he is a believer from another church, but we can come together as adopted family members, you know, in the body of Christ. And, you know, this is beautiful. So thank God for that. Anything else before we go to prayer? Good? Okay, let's pray. Oh. Okay. Today is also Okay. He's not the best at all. He struggles to get along. Yeah, I heard he taught you everything you know, right? That's what he said. Uh, uh. Even though I'm older than you, like four months. Yeah. <laughs> and I know people on Facebook are getting real crazy trying to figure it out. Well, we'll let them. Why I'm only four months old. You're a miracle, that's why. Right. Well, let's pray. Father God, thank you for laughter. Thank you for the chance to come together and celebrate fellowship and friendship. Father, thank you for the chance to come to you in prayer, to spend time in your word. Father, we are so immensely blessed. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with some praises from our family, Father. Thank you that Ryan is doing better and is home from the hospital. Thank you that John's ablation went so well. Father, we continue to lift up Craig as he recovers. Please be with him and his whole family. Father, we open up to the world. We thank you for the testimony we heard from Puerto Rico about the hundreds of people who came in to help um, run VBS and do missions projects, do, do construction projects, and to, to minister and love on each other. Thank you, Father, for everything that's happening in the pantry, for the produce from Bushels of Blessing, and the canned goods from the mission, and the chickens from the mission, and the volunteers from other churches. And just thank you, Father, that we are in the middle of this big, swirling, just amazing, love, crazy, blessing mess. Thank you, Father. We want to give you praise again for Sunday night. Such a wonderful night. Um, you know, we had fun with the adults, but Father, thank you for a dozen kids playing in the gym. Um, it really is a blessing, Father. Thank you for trusting us with those kids, and please help us to continue to minister well. Father, we lift up this husband and wife who are dealing with some significant health problems. Um, the husband, as he's being, being to be treated for kidney stones, and uh, his wife, who is doing a little bit better, but in still need of care. Father, we pray for them as a couple, um, especially that they would be able to be back together soon. Father, we lift up um, Jim and Carol's son-in-law, Pete. Um, we pray that you would be with him as he recovers um, in a rehab facility, and we lift up his liver and kidney function to you specifically, Father. Please continue to be with him. We lift up Janice's nephew, who is... Um, being treated for the brain tumor. We lift up baby Troy, who is uh, gaining weight and working his way up to fighting weight to get a kidney transplant. But thank you for um, being with him and his family through this journey. Uh, a newlywed couple, first baby, Father, this is a lot of stress. and um, We pray that you would continue to hold them all in the palm of your hand. Father, we lift up Rick and his family, the whole camp family. Father, thank you so much that we got to visit their house last night. And thank you for Rick's prayer for us. We went there thinking we're going to pray for him, and he's praying for us. And everybody's hugging like we've known each other forever. And just thank, thank you for that blessing, Father. We lift up all the households and families that we visited last night. We lift up the Ragones. We lift up the Brooks, along with their children and grandchildren. Father, we lift up um, Deborah and Barbara. Father, I just thank you for that chance to go out and pray. Um, please help us to lift up all these families. Um, we especially lift up Darlene's daughter and her children. And uh, thank you that they were there among the dozen on Sunday night. And we pray for her as she continues to try to uh, help care for them and love on them. And, uh, we think of some of other some other families who have not been able to be out lately for lots of different reasons, Father. Um, 
we lift up Walt and Nancy to you, Father. We lift up uh, Charles and Donna. Uh, we thank you that Tony's been able to come out, but we lift up Wilma to you, who has not. Um, we think of Janet. We think of Bonnie, who's at home with her injured foot. Uh, we think of Faye. Um, we think of Helen Husser, Father. Um, Deborah, of course, who we mentioned. That I'm, Father, I know I'm, not, I know I'm not getting everybody, and I apologize for the names that aren't coming to me right now, but we lift up all of our brothers and sisters who can't be with us face to face, um, but we thank you that we can lift them up in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, we lift up Russ, who had his heart procedure yesterday. Father, we pray that that went well. We lift up Betty and Luke. We pray that you would continue to be with them on their journey. We lift up Eric's neighbor, two of them, one, his neighbor Wayne, and his cancer treatment, and this other neighbor that Eric was able to bring some food to. We lift up Bethany in her job search, Father. Uh, please be with her and, and open those right doors. Father, we lift up Pastor Ralph from Bridgeton and his treatment with cancer. We pray that you would continue to be with him. Uh, we lift up all those in Kentucky who are dealing with these floods, Father. Um, just this terrible weather. We've got fires out west again and floods in the east and just Father we lift it up to you. We need help. We need help and I pray that you would help all of us as believers to rally together and care for one another in these difficult seasons. We lift up Jim's brother Johnny on his birthday Father. We pray that you would be with his health. We lift up Venus and her health journey and uh, we think of her job situation Father. We know they are on a four day work week right now. Things are tight. We pray that you would continue to provide for Venus and her co-workers. We lift up our brothers and sisters in the Philippines who experienced this earthquake, Father. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Ukraine uh, still dealing with this war. Father, we know that sometimes whatever's freshest pushes other things out of our mind, and I pray that you help us to keep this conflict right at the front of our prayer requests. Father, we pray for peace. We pray for the fighting to stop. We pray for all of the the children and families that have been split up and our refugees. We pray for the thousands who have lost loved ones on both sides, Father. We pray for peace. We pray for peace. Father, thank you for this chance to be together tonight. Thank you for the way you've been speaking to us through the prophecies you gave to Ezekiel. And uh, Father, I, I pray as we're continuing to talk about Ezekiel's call to be a watchman, that you would help us to take on that same mantle. That you would help us to be watch people. Um, shouting out warnings, offering help. Um, being the city on the hill, the lamp on the sand that we're supposed to be. Please help us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I kind of gave it away, but we are continuing in Ezekiel 33 tonight. We started the very beginning of the chapter last week where God explained uh, the role of a watchman and told Ezekiel that he was going to be one. So just as a quick recap, does anybody remember what exactly God said was Ezekiel's responsibility? To protect the city. To protect the city? Okay. Well, I mean, like, as a watchman. Okay, as a watchman. So he's supposed to shout the warning, right? Mm -hmm. What if he doesn't? What if he refuses to shout the warning? Yeah. If he refuses, their death will be on him. Now I know I kind of interrupted because I got excited. Sorry. What if, what if um, he does tell them and they decide not to listen? Their deaths are on them. It's on them, right? And he's kind of been filling that role all along, right? He's been shouting these words of warning. Yeah. Um, I want to just just to make sure that we're all together on this. Um, I think that let me see. Let's go ahead and reread verses one through nine. I know we read this last week, but just to get it fresh in our heads and hearts. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's Darlene's up. Okay. 
Darlene has to go first every night. <laughs> it's your job now. <laughs> uh, can you do one through nine to start us off? Thank you. The word of the Lord came to me, the mortal, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land, and the people of the land take one of their number as their sentinel, and if the sentinel see the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet do not take the warning and the sword comes and takes them away, their blood shall be upon their own enemies. We heard the sound of the trumpet, and we did not take warning. We looked into the pipe of the American. We heard the sound of the trumpet, and did not take warning. Their blood shall be upon themselves. But if they had taken warning, they would have saved their lives. But if the sentinel sees the fool coming, and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any of them, they are taken away in their iniquity, but their blood I will require as a sentinel to take. Mm. So you mortal, the nine, right? Mm -hmm. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not seek to warn the wicked, to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require as recompense. But if you want the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn away from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Thank you. That's like a very long time. It is. It is. So we talked about the imagery, but I want to get into the details a little bit. In if Ezekiel was a traditional watchman on a traditional city wall, what kind of thing would he mostly be watching for? Any soldiers? Soldiers, yeah. Enemies, people. Enemy people that were coming to hurt him. Yeah. Now, like a lot of this prophetic imagery, there are layers, right? So the, the people he's speaking to, are they dealing with something like that? Are they dealing with an armed conflict that they've got to watch out for? Remember, where is Ezekiel right now? Yeah, and how did he get there? Yeah, he's carried off by soldiers, right? So there is the physical aspect of, hey, there's an army coming to kill us. But there's another layer, too. Um, if we kind of think back on some of the, the things, some of the messages that Ezekiel's been given to say to the people, is his job as a watchman just to warn about men with swords? No. no. What's he really warning the people about? I guess not obeying the word of God. I'm sorry, I didn't hear yours. They're sinful life. Yeah, sinful life and disobeying the word of God. Exactly, perfect. Both perfect answers. Um, the people have not been obeying God. They're warned. And now we've got the consequence. All right. Any questions about that? All right, so Ezekiel has a job as a watchman, but like any watchman, you've got to be able to communicate to the people, right? You've got to have a message. Um, I'm sure that um, I remember, and I'm going to mess some of this up, but um, like Jim, my grandfather was in the Navy, and I remember him one time trying to, he had one of his books out, and he was teaching me um, about communicating with flags, right? And how... The, the, yep, so, signalman. yeah, signalman, right? So if your radio went, I mean, of course you had a radio, but if your radio went down, this was one way you could communicate with another ship. And they had different flags and different ways of holding them and moving them, and you could communicate a whole bunch of stuff. Just with, you could just have a pair of binoculars looking at a guy with a flag, and he could tell you what's going on with their ship, what you need to do with your ship, where they're going, where they've been, is there, are they in trouble, all kinds of stuff. But you've got to speak a common language, right? Another one, an another one that's often used on ships at night um, that my grandfather tried to teach me that I failed at was Morse code, right? Flashing the light. Yeah, you're flashing the shutter on the light. Exactly. Yeah, so um, if you're at night, you can flash a light in a pattern. The patterns mean letters. 
you know, you've probably heard SOS, the dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 right? But if the person on one vote knows Morse code and the person on the other vote doesn't know Morse code, what's it going to look like? A bunch of dots and dashes. Yeah, a bunch of flashing lights. Like, are they having a party over there? <laughs> right. you got to have a common language. Right? So um, Ezekiel's got the job description that he is a watchman. And he's been given some messages for lots of different people in different places. But now this is like the big picture, right? You as a prophet, as a watchman, to your people, this is the heart of your message. Right? So let's get into what God says. Um, could somebody read verses? We're going to start with 10 and 11. Thank you. Exactly. Son of man. <laughs> Give the people of Israel this message. You are saying our sins are heavy upon us. We are wasting away. How can we survive? As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn. Turn from your wickedness of people of your people of Israel. Why should you die? Thank you. So there's been a little bit of miscommunication here, right? Like somebody who didn't study Morse code one. What are the people saying to God in verse 10? They're saying that their sins are weighing heavy on their soul. Yeah. And they don't, they're afraid they won't be able to bear it. They yeah. won't be able to God, you're going to kill us. Yeah, we can't take it. We've read some pretty harsh things, right? Yeah, there are lots of people that don't know what they have to do in order to correct it, and they could. Exactly. And exactly. as we continue on, that's exactly where God goes with it. And, you know, did God spring rules on these people that they've never heard before? No. No, these are the same same instructions they had for since they, before they had a cane. Right? Same rules, same expectations. Um, and yet, they're not doing it. And then, they're experiencing a punishment. And um, I, I did a little bit of research this week. I don't know if you guys... So we use a couple different words when we talk about what's happening in those prophetic books. We're talking about punishments from God and consequences of choices. And I got a little wishy-washy on that. Like what, what exactly is the difference? And I heard a really good definition this week in that podcast I've been talking about. I'm listening to a series they're doing on exile. But the, the teacher in that podcast said, and it's the Bible project, if anybody wants to follow it, um, he said that a consequence is something that happens as a direct result of your choices. <coughs> And a punishment is something that comes from the outside. Okay? Now, it's interesting because, well, which of those things are these people dealing with? And I'll give you a hint. It's your question. Both things. Both things, yeah. So they've got the whole double cross Egypt backdoor plan to fight Babylon thing. And so, in a way, Babylon attacking them is a consequence of that, right? because they tried to sneak up and sucker punch the bully and got caught, right? But also, God has risen up Nebuchadnezzar as a sword to come down on the people. So it's a little bit of both, right? Yes, and, God told Babylon about it, and then... Well, remember, said Babylon came to the crossroads and wasn't sure which way to go, and God said, you're going that way. Mm -hmm. Go, go smack them. God's pulling out the belt and then giving it to Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. So, if we were to just read the factual events, it sounds pretty horrible, right? I mean, lots of people dying. You know, we talk about the city being under siege and people starving and being sick and, you know, people wishing they had died. Remember way back when Ezekiel had to cook food on dung? It's gonna be like, this is what it's going to be like. People are going to be so hungry for bread that they'll use cow dung for their fires and, you know, Really bad stuff, right? That gold and silver will be worthless because people are starving and sick. And 
there are a lot of people who have read these kinds of things and think, well, God's kind of being a jerk. If God loves these people so much, why is he why is he beating up on them so much? And in these two verses, God is able to kind of speak back against that charge and explain himself a little bit. Right? When you've got a significant question about God in the Bible, one of the best tools you have is the Bible. And if we have those questions, they probably did too. And God speaks to them. He says, as surely as I live. Let's just start there. If I were to say that to you, as surely as I live, Jim, we're going to pick up food from the mission. What do I mean? It's going to happen. Yeah, I put my life on it. So if I fail, I'll die trying. So I might fail, but I'm going to give it everything I got, right? But everything I got is not everything in the world, right? You know, my truck might break, break down, I got a bad back, whatever. Right? There are limitations to what I can do. When God says, as surely as I live, what does that mean? It's going to happen. It's gonna happen. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. So God says, as surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord. So I promise it's going to happen, says the God who's in control of everything. That's what Sovereign means. Remember, he's in control. So the God who is in control says, as surely as I live, and then he says something. I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. If God were an earthly judge, and he sentenced a wicked person to a punishment, would that be just? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, if you knew a rule, you knew there'd be a consequence to breaking it, you chose to break it, you have the trial, you're convicted, you get the punishment. We would call that justice, right? Yeah, we call that justice. Does God take pleasure in exacting justice on these people? No. no. Even though they're wicked and they deserve it, it, do, it does not bring him pleasure. What does God want? He says, well, that's what, that's what he, and that's what he says thanks, right? He says there's only one thing he wants. What does he want? And there's a kind of a fancy New Testament word we use for that sometimes. What did John the Baptist say? Repent. Repent. Remember the puppet? Repent. I will forever remember Charlene as John the Baptist. Repent. Repent, right? That's what God wants. Right? Psalm 51, right? We talked about it on Sunday night. God doesn't want our sacrifices. He wants our hearts. So God's saying, I don't want to punish wicked people. It gives me no pleasure to punish the wicked. I want the wicked to turn so they can live. And he ends verse 11 with a question. What's the question he ends verse 11 with? Do a little bit of Bible quizzing now. Everybody ready? Got all your memory verses in there? Okay. This is going to be an easy one. The first, the si first six words, I had to count the words, I used my fingers. The first six words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only son. I'm going to be we kind of sang it in this. We sang it in the song this past Sunday. Exactly. That whoever believes in Jesus will not perish and have everlasting life. It's almost like God's been saying the same thing the whole time, and we're just a bunch of names who don't understand it. I don't. God's saying, I don't want you to die. I don't want this to happen to you. I don't want you to trust in Egypt and have to deal with the devil cross and get killed. I don't want you to sacrifice your children to other gods. I don't want you to choose these sins that break your relationships and break your community, right? God's saying, I don't want you to do these things because I don't want you to be hurting. That breaks their communication with God. Yeah. So the people knew the rules, right? They got them written down, right? 
So what is the message that Ezekiel's trying to share? What did God just say in verse 11? Repent. God doesn't want you to die. Right? This is yeah. Repent. <laughs> yeah. Now you need to have the hot dog hat. <laughs> you were the hot dog vendor in that one, right? Yeah. Same thing John the Baptist said, right? The fact that the kingdom of heaven is near. Right? Same thing Jesus said. You know, I'm the way through the line. Yeah. Same story over and over again, right? Choose life. Deuteronomy 30, right? Choose life. A cho- you see, uh, there's a choice for you today. A choice between life and death. Yeah. Oh, that you would choose life. Yeah. It's almost like God's been saying the same thing the whole time, right? Yeah. Back to Adam and Eve. You'll surely die. You'll surely die. Exactly. exactly. And I think that sentence right there, if I were to sum up the job of a prophet, that's it. The job of a prophet is to tell the people, it doesn't have to be like this. Right? The way it is, it, doesn't, it wasn't supposed to be like this, it doesn't have to be like this. Right? God didn't want Jerusalem to be destroyed. God didn't want the temple to be broken down. God didn't want all these people to suffer and die. It didn't have to be like this. It didn't have to be like this. All right, let's continue on. And God kind of gets into his explanation of righteous people, wicked people, and who's forgiven, who's not, why this is all happening, right? Could somebody read verses 12 to 16, please? Thank you. Another man, give your people the message the righteous behavior of righteous people will not save them if they t- turn to sin. Nor will the wicked behavior of wicked people destroy them if they repent and turn from their sin. When I tell righteous people that they will live, but then they sin, expecting their past righteousness to save them, then none of their righteous acts will be remembered. I will destroy them for their sins. And suppose I tell some wicked people that they will surely die, but then they turn from their sins and do what is just and right. For instance, they might give back a debtor's security, return what they have stolen, and obey by life giving laws no longer doing what is evil. If they do this, then they will surely live and not die. None of their sins, none of their past sins will be brought up again, nor for they have done what is just and right, and they will surely live. Thank you. Now, this is one of those times where God says the same thing five different ways, and it gets a little tricky in our heads. So I'm going to use an object lesson, okay? Can you be a helper for me? Yes. Okay. Come on up here. Stand with me. All right. We're going to be the two people in the story, right? right? You're going to be the wicked person. All right? Gur. Gur. So Josiah's wicked, right? Gur. He's a wicked person. He has stolen things from people. That's what it said, right? But. I will steal your candy from your baby. Right. He has stolen candy from all the babies. <laughs> but Josiah repents and he gives back the candy. And he asks God to forgive him, and he starts following God. What will happen? Will he be punished for what he did, or will he be forgiven? He will be forgiven. Why? He will surely live. He will surely live. Because he repented. Because he changed, right? Okay. He did a good job. Okay. Woo-hoo. Now, let's say I am the righteous person. Right? <laughs> Still, I came from a baby and a knucklehead. Right? <laughs> and even though I have been righteous, I start to sin. My heart turns hard, and I start doing terrible things. And I'm not repentant. And I say things to God that are terrible. And I hurt people. You will show it You will show it Why? Because you're a knucklehead. But I was righteous all those years, Jim. Yeah, but you're sinning now. Yeah. Because yeah. this isn't about math, right? You know, and, and this, is, this is really important because it's going against the culture of the dead, right? The Egyptians had this really fancy ceremony, right? They believed 
that this thing would happen after you die, where your heart would be weighed on a balance. Yeah, and you and you just and he's gonna go away. I forget what kind of Yeah, your is. heart would be weighed. Your heart would be on one side, and there would be a feather on the other. And if your sins would make your heart heavy, and if your heart was heavier than the feather, you'd go to the bad place. And if your heart was lighter than the feather, you'd go to the good place, right? And if it so it was all about the sum total of your choices, right? So if you had stolen candy from ten babies, but it helped twenty-five babies, well then you're fifteen in the good, and you'd go to paradise. That was what a lot of those ancient cultures thought when it came to morality, right? God is trying to teach them something different, right? Remember what he said to David about sacrifices? I don't want your bull. Your bull's already mine. You're not giving it to me. I made the bull, right? He doesn't want the bull. He wants the heart, right? And when it comes to relationship, well, primacy and recency are important, right? The big things and the recent things are really important. I always pick on you and on marriage, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. You know, if Jill and I have 20 years of good marriage, and then I spend a year cheating on her, what's our marriage going to be like? Crack. Over. <laughs> Over, right? Now, what if we have a really bad year in the beginning where I cheat on her, but then I repent, and I ask for forgiveness, and I change, and we have 20 good years? What's our marriage going to be like? Good. Good. Yeah. Where that bad year happens affects the relationship, right? And and what I did before or after, right? In the first example, I didn't repent, so I was really bad. In the example where I repented and changed and showed that, well, then I was really good. So that's what God is saying, right? Now, this this kind of makes sense, right? But let's put it back into context and remember who Ezekiel's talking to, right? He's been speaking to all the people of Jerusalem, but remember, we had several words in a row spoken against the the people in charge, right? The royal family, the priests, the leaders, right? The the ones who were shaping the the culture. And even though it was slightly different, what was the basic charge against all these people? They were committing adultery. Yeah. Well, they were cheating on God. Adultery works, yeah. You know? They were supposed to set the example and teach people how to live, and they were leading the other way and teaching everybody the wrong way. Kind of um, like they're also bad. marrying women of other cultures, and yeah. Yeah. So lots of different things, but the basic idea is they were they were turning away and bringing other people with them. Now Ezekiel is a good watcher, and what he's supposed to do, what's he supposed to do? Supposed to be yeah. Why would these people who are doing these terrible things? Why would they still expect God to help them? Why would they still expect God to protect Jerusalem or protect the temple? Every time they get the wine and they cry, he helps them out. And then they're like, yay, and then they're good for a while, and they go back to that. Because of the church and people. Yeah. It's just like a lot of people. A cycle today. of sin, yeah. It's just like a lot of people today, they think God is a loving God. You know, he'll never do that to them. Yeah. And that's basically what they thought, right? This is God's temple. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. You know, this, yeah, this is the city of David. It's never been taken by an enemy. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen people of Abraham's covenant. So they thought that past righteousness was good enough that they could be wicked right now and get away with it. That's not how it works, right? That's not how it works. Okay, so let's continue now. The people speak out against God again. And this will probably be where we stop for now. <clears throat> Can somebody read 17 to 20, and then we're going to button it up with a song. All right. Okay. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just. When it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turn from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. And when the wicked turn from their wickedness to do what is lawful and right, they shall live by it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge all of you according to your wickedness. Thank you. 
So the people are saying, Lord, you're not just. Yeah. Well, you said this was your temple. And you said we were your holy people. Did God say those things? Yes. I mean, he did say that, right? This is my house. This is my temple. You know, what did they call the country they lived in? The promised land. And who made that promise? God. God, right? This is the land that God had promised to them. Right? How did they get that land? Yep, God made the promise to Abraham when he was wandering around with his animals, right? Although Abraham was, a, you know, a wandering um, Aramean, right? He didn't actually get to live with him. You know, he didn't have all these kids. He just had a couple. Yeah. So, let's do a little family story, right? Abraham's got a kid. He's okay. A little bit of a knucklehead. Okay. He's got twins. They're both kind of knuckleheads, although one turns out better in the end. And then that knucklehead, he's got 12 knuckleheads, right? And those 12 knuckleheads, well, they all round up and 11 of them try to kill one of them. Well, 10. 10 try to kill one. And he, you know, just knuckleheads the whole lot, right? They end up in Egypt. And what happens after they're living in Egypt? That one saves their lives. Yep, that one saves their lives. Yay, everybody comes to live in Egypt. We have rain, let's live in Goshen. But as the years go on, what happens between those people and Egypt? Egypt takes them as slaves. Egypt takes them as slaves, right? So now the chosen people, the children of Abraham, are slaves in Egypt. Well, that's not exactly the people in the promised land. So what does God do? Brings them out. Brings them out, right? Ten plagues, parting of the sea. They get there, the grapes are so big they can't lift them. And what do the people say? That guy's big. Oh. Yeah. So God's like, all right, the number of days the spies were in the land or the number of years you're going to wander. They were in there for 40 days, you're going to wander for 40 years. They wander for 40 years. They get back to the land. Moses does his great, you know, the, the, the Deuteronomy teachings, the retelling of the law. He dies by Moses. Um, Joshua's in charge, right? They have another river crossing, the water's parted, they build the stones, yay. They get to Jericho, and what happens? They take it down. They take it down, right? Do they fight it? Are they like ninjas? No. No, they're a marching band. Exactly. They're not ninjas, they're not Navy SEALs. They're, yay, do do wall right? I'm, I'm, I'm playing this up a little bit. Marching band. They eventually became warriors, but at that point, marching band. So God gives them the land. It is the promised land that he gives to them. But when he brought them into the promised land, well, a covenant, a vow, it takes two sides, right? What happens to a marriage if one person tries to keep the vow and the other one doesn't? It's broken, yeah. right? Divided. Now, God knew that this was going to be a problem, so he provided a way for it to be fixed, right? And that's what he just said. If you repent, you'll be forgiven. So let's read about that. I want to read um, Psalm 103. And this is a way that God knew the people were going to be knuckleheads because they've been knuckleheads and they're people. So he made a way for this to be done. All right, so let me, I'm talking enough, turn it to me. Um, who has not read yet? Joe, did you read that? Would you like to read Psalm 103 for us? Sure. Thank you. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. 
as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed their transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you. We're going to do a real quick walkthrough of this, right? David says in verse 2, May I never forget, right? May I never forget. Verse 7, God revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. God has revealed himself to us, right? He is known to us. Okay? Verse 8, The Lord is compassionate and merciful slow to anger, and filled with unfailing love. Right? Amen. That's a very popular verse to be quoted. Right? When he forgives us, what does he do to our sin? Verse 12. And he removes it completely. Wow, that's, that's good. Why does he do that? Why would he be willing to forgive us? Verse 14. He's a loving God. But more than that, he knows that we are we, Dust. Yeah. Bunch of idiots, right? No he knows our limitations, right? He knows that on our own we cannot be righteous, right? right? We can only we can only be made right through him, and so he says we'll do it, right? But there is one in, in verse seventeen: the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear Him. His salvation extends to the children's children. Right? And this is where Israel speaks up. God, you said that your love would remain forever and that your salvation would extend to the children's children, to generations. And here we got Babylon knocking on our walls. But there's a verse that comes after verse 17. What is in verse 18? The Lord will do these things for those who are faithful to his covenant and obey his commandments. Had the people done that? Nope. They're trying to blame it on God. Yeah. They're trying to blame it on God. Yeah. Not only have they not done it, they're blaming God for it. Yeah. We would never do something like that, would we? Uh, yeah. Hmm. You know. Do you remember what Adam said when God confronted him in the garden after? Yeah. The woman you gave me. Yeah. Did, yeah. This whole blaming it on God thing. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an old song. Right? We've been doing it from the beginning. God, why did you do this to me? Right? Yeah. I did you did this to yourself. Yeah. And God's saying, You did it to yourself, and I knew you were gonna get your dust. So repent. And you'll be forgiven. Some people don't. Yeah. Some people choose not to. If you look at these patterns, they're there all along. You know, Solomon's prayer of dedication for the temple is a really interesting one. He gets up to give his prayer of dedication when they build the temple, the one that's about to be destroyed. And you think he gives them like, God, you know, rip the lips from our enemies and make us victorious and fill us with treasure and you think he'd give one of those kind of like, you know, pep rally speeches, right? But he doesn't. He basically, about 14 different ways, says, God, when we're idiots, when we are unfaithful, when we turn from you and we sin, if we give our hearts back to you, hear us and forgive. He talks about armies coming in or rains being withheld from the land or locusts or whatever, right? He says, God, when we do this, not if, when, when we sin, if we repent, please hear us. That's his prayer of dedication for this temple that's about to be destroyed. 
because the people didn't do that. So over and over and over, the people have been told, on your own, you're not. You can't, you can't do it. But God loves us enough that he provides a way. He provides a way for us to be forgiven and to be made right with him. And he does the heavy lifting, but the hard part, the decision part, that's got to come from us. He doesn't force that on like David said, he says the offering that you will not reject is a contrite, a broken heart, a repentant heart. That is the offering God will not reject. Because does God want us to die? We just read it right now. He doesn't want us to die. He brings him no pleasure to punish the wicked. He wants us to live. For God so gave his only son that we might live. So, we can look at these guys and say, man, look at all the things they did that were wrong. I would have never done all that stuff. But wait. You could take the word Jerusalem and put in America. Pretty much everything he says applies to us right now. And I'm not saying you as an individual. I'm saying us as a group. Right? A country that supposedly a, a, a Christian nation, one nation under God, and yet we're not acting like it. We're chasing treasures and power and kingdoms and glory. And, you know, we're not loving each other, we're shooting each other. You got billionaires while kids starve. Yeah. So, this is the role of the prophet, right? the role of the watchman. It's the role of us to say, the way it is right now, it's not right. It's not how it should be. But also, it doesn't have to stay this way. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. So that's our job. Right? And we're going to get into this more. I know we didn't have time to go through all of chapter 33, but um, we'll get into this more next week. Because there's an extra layer here and that's what we're going to address next. Jerusalem is going to fall. The temple will be destroyed, and burned, and broken. This treasure is carried on. But, will all the people die? There's a remnant. Yeah. People like Ezekiel and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. yeah. So next week, Ezekiel's going to start talking to that crew. And they're going to get a messenger back from Jerusalem. A messenger from Jerusalem is finally going to make it back to where Ezekiel and the, the captives are. And he's going to tell them what's been going on back in Jerusalem. Now, Ezekiel's been speaking these prophecies with the dates and everything that's happening, right? But at the end of chapter, as we go into 33, now somebody's going to come back to confirm all of that. All this stuff that's happened. So the people are going to be thinking, man, all this stuff Ezekiel said, it happened. It happened. Right, so we'll get into that more. Um, next week we'll pick up at verse 21 where, uh, yeah, where there's actually a new vision. Um, and they find out the city has been destroyed. The city has fallen. Um, there's also a little detail I want to sprinkle in to get you thinking before I do. Something really significant happened to Ezekiel personally a little bit ago. Do you remember? His wife died. His wife died, yeah. He wasn't allowed to mourn. Yep. He wasn't allowed to mourn. And God said, when the messenger comes back to tell you of all your family that's dead, people are not going to go to mourn either. And he actually stopped up Ezekiel's voice. Now, we haven't really mentioned it because we've been hearing God talk to Ezekiel over and over again, right? Son of man do this, son of man say that. But Ezekiel has not gotten his voice back yet. Right? Because that messenger that God spoke of when he told him about his voice dying, that's the God who's going to show up in, verse, in chapter 33. Right? So, so, it's, so Ezekiel is only writing this down and having someone else speak about this. It hasn't been spoken. It's all been written down, but Ezekiel has not been able to speak to that. 
We don't know exactly what was written and who read what at this point. But, but from not the whole book of Ezekiel, but from his wife's death till now, Ezekiel has not been able to speak to him. Wasn't well, that like five chapters ago? Yeah, know. but it was like a, you could read it in 20 minutes. And even though the dates of when this stuff is supposed to happen, you know, um, we don't know exactly all the timeline here, you know, how long it was between each vision, or, you know, he got a vision, he got a vision, he got a vision, was it an hour apart, did they come back to back? We have all this. Ezekiel's going to get his voice back, and they're going to hear the word. What was that? Spoilers. Jesus wins. So. so this whole time he's been in jail and not in prison. Well, yeah, not necessarily in prison, but he is a prisoner of war. So they really were brought back to be slaves, to be used. Right? They gathered up anybody they thought could be useful. Right? Um, so people who could read and write, like Ezekiel. And Daniel and, and, right, and, Daniel and his friends. But also anybody who knew a trade. Exactly. He wasn't actually in a jail cell, but he was. We would say in slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even people who, and you see this in the book of Daniel. Even though Daniel has a pretty decent life, he still is a slave to the king. And if he disobeys, he'll still cut out or feed him the lions. Yeah, so there are different. He's not necessarily locked in a jail cell, but he's not really free either. Good question. Good question. All right, anything else before we finish up for tonight? All right, let's pray again. Father God, thank you for another chance to study your word. Thank you for the truth you've been revealing to us and. Father, I pray that you would help each of us in our own place on the wall to be the watch people that you've appointed. Father, I pray that you would help us to look for what you are doing, to listen to your message, and to share it with the world. Father, I pray that we would also share your heart. You just said that you don't want anyone to perish, that it brings you no pleasure to see people punished. And what you want is for people to be forgiven. And Father, I pray that we would have that same heart, that we would have a passion for the lost, and that we would, we would have that same drive to see people be made right with you, to be forgiven, to be made whole, to be made well, to know your peace, to know your blessing, to have that gift of Psalm 103, to have our sins removed as far as the east is from the west. Father, help us to bring that same gift to as many people as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, thank you guys very much. Good night, Jeannie. Good night, Jeannie. Good night, Jane. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Good night. Um, who else is on here? Trudy. Uh, Good night, Jane. Good night, Diane. And maybe even Bethany sitting next to Diane possibly various cats and dogs from the neighborhood. <laughs> but good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. So what I'm the most excited about is a nine-year-old. Sorry you didn't like that. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Avery liked it. Everyone I loved it. it. I liked it.